I got, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Well, uh, good afternoon or good evening. Um, I'm very bitterly sad not to actually be in Bucharest. It's more than 20 years since my once uh, visit there. And your last proper speaker re referred to its heterogeneous condition. And I think I speak from London, which is another city which has uh, interestingly heterogeneous uh, conditions. We don't get around much in London. We, we look at it from the car very briefly and then scamper back into safety. But uh, it's out there and it's still wanting to be out there. And of course, the, uh, the paradox or the irony at the moment is what of the city is worth reinventing, bearing in mind what we are ex ex experiencing right now. On the other hand, I've spent virtually a lifetime reinventing the city. I have only been allowed to build little tiny pieces, and but nonetheless, the city is there. And I think if we didn't have it, we would wish to invent it. Now I press that button and nothing happens. So. I I have to ask you, Sir Peter Cook, to uh, go to the top center of your screen on the yeah. View Options button. There. Click it so it drops down and then request um, control of presentation or something like that. You have to double click that and then you uh, will automatically get it from the technical staff. Now I've done that. Uh, then you should try the arrows, but be aware there is a certain delay about couple of seconds or so. I'm trying the arrows and nothing is happening. Just first click on the screen, wherever you want, and then try again the arrows. Ah, now. Great. Now I've gone past the first one now. Can, can I back? Yes. yes. Okay, this is, a, this is the slide I made before the pandemic. But always there's this discussion about the city. Do we love it or do we hate it? Is it a nightmare? And this was a kind of, this was done for a magazine cover of my notion of a, a kind of nightmare, but a kind of <laughs> lovable nightmare, almost like, a, like you enjoy a comic, but you don't want it really to happen. Is, it, is the city the scene of intrigue? Is it just, and we're back to the heterogeneous nature, is it just a collection of stuff? Or is it just plain fascinating? Are, are we fascinated with cities? And, you know, those of us who don't want to live on a mountaintop or in the middle of a desert, we, we, we have reasons for not wishing to. Now, it doesn't want to go forward again. Ah, or do we create an escape? This is a very, very old drawing of mine from... 30 or could be more years ago, when I was looking at the notion of hiding a high piece of architectural intensity, but hiding it almost in a gully, in a, in a kind of dip in the countryside so that you wouldn't see it. You would only come upon it when you got near to it. Uh, I was fascinated with things that don't have to be seen, but are there. Now, again, I need to move forward. And then I went through a period of being very interested in how architectural elements could be concealed within what is apparently a piece of nature. And I keep coming back to that. I've never built it in nature. My few buildings are all in campuses or in, in, in the city, but nonetheless, uh, I'm fascinated by losing things in the garden. We have a, a large garden here and we are constantly losing things in it and putting things in it. It's a fascinating that, the, that many people have written, particularly in, if you read Simon Shamar's uh, book about landscape, that the notion of the garden is very closely entwined with the notion of urbanism. Now, again, it doesn't want to move forward, but maybe you can move it for me, thank you. Here is uh, maybe five years ago or so, 
a drawing that I spent a lot of time making. I was sitting in, in Norway looking at a combination of natural landscape and the extremities of the city of Oslo and fascinated again by the notion that perhaps the physiognomy of certain kind of natural forms and certainly the physiognomy of organized natural forms and the physiognomy of contrived forms or even tectonic forms, that there, there could be a strange kind of, not exactly symbiosis, almost a kind of mystery game, which, which pieces are natural growth, but following almost a tectonic series of moves, and which pieces are actually inserted pieces of architecture, which might get lost in the undergrowth, and which are other pieces of implicit architecture, and if you look hard at the drawing, you can find them, that are in a way ambiguously related to the, the, the physicality or the organizational, the, the flow, the, 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 the flow, if you like, of, of, of the nature. And I was almost playing a game with myself, but I still, back to the earlier drawings, I was still calling it hidden city. But what I was saying, this is actually implicitly a kind of urban organization. It's just 90%, 99% vegetation. Now, again, I can't seem to move. I think I'm going to ask you to do the moving because it'll save time. It, it's just a delay. It's so okay. it's working. Thank you. Okay, okay. <laughs> I'll trust that. Uh, now, I think in, in a rolling sort of, I, not all English countryside is like this, but a lot of it still is. It is, again, really a tradition of this ambiguity. There in the picture are probably something like 300 people living, maybe more, but they're in amongst the trees. The village is not overt, it's, it's implicit, it's tucked in. And perhaps if you look into the far distance, if you look very hard, you can see even more buildings, but not very many. There's this this kind of thousand or more years tradition. Maybe you have it in Romania too, but I've, it's very particular to the English that you, you have it, but you hide it, but you like letting it express itself. In other words, and, and now that we have the internet and we have, you know, vehicle transportation and, and, and uh, any time soon, a lot of drones, uh, the village, you could probably live in as sort of 95% as sophisticated a, uh, an experience. And we know this with the, with the lockdown, that somebody can live in that village and probably do as many things as if they could go into the city of London, except that they don't go into the city of London. They look out on a lot of trees. And, and of course, this is perhaps for the privileged 50% and other people still crowd themselves into town. But it, it does, it, the attractiveness of this and perhaps the underlying link between it and the drawings, those particular drawings that I made, is, was an indulgence and now becomes able to be re-questioned. Is it more than an indulgence? Is it a, is it a desire? Is it more than a desire? What would happen if the majority of, <clears throat> let's say, the British population started to move into these situations. Well, of course, the easy answer is to say it would destroy them. But nonetheless, it makes you think. It makes you think. I'll press. Ah, of course, all those years ago, I was bright eyed and bushy tailed, and I felt that, you know, technology could do a lot of. Things. It could reinvent, it could get us out of the, the, the sort of claustrophobia of the fixed city of the house has to stay like the house, like the house, like the house, the street, like the street. It could, it could pulsate, it could move. One of the things that I think is not ever discussed with this particular drawing, uh, but it was in my mind and is still in my mind about it, is that it's actually quite a romantic view of prefabrication. I was in my day job at the time working on prefabrication for a short while. And this was really a cri de coeur from the young guy working on prefabrication and saying, it doesn't have to be as boring as it always seems to be. Oh. 
And later one made a, a series of projects to do with solar energy and also, but it still had that kind of mechanistic take upon it. It still enjoyed, I think this is very much a sort of neoconstructivist drawing, that it's still enjoying the combination of modernism, the machine, the solar collector, and then allowed in, but only just some free open space. And then in, in another project, still quite a long time ago, I started exploring the idea of the vertical park. I'd been by this time one or two times to Japan, to the wonderful gardens of Kyoto. And although this project is, is based in Frankfurt and is actually for a museum and a hotel, nonetheless, it's trying to explore the rather probably expensive notion of what happens if we start putting the parks in the sky. It was also prompted, strangely enough, by visiting a vineyard in a uh, in nearby part of Germany where the plants were put up on very high racks, maybe 10 meters high. And it, that gave me the idea, I thought, ah, oh, if you can put vineyards onto a giant rack, could you put people amongst the vineyards, so to speak? And then much later, I as a byproduct of another project, which is a university project, uh, was looking into the, just the notion of really putting the city in the sky, but leaving a lot of air. If you read the red as sky, actually, a lot of air between the parts. I mean, going much further than MVDVR do with just putting a hole in it, actually really putting trays and, and allowing a lot of sunlight and vegetation to come in between the trays. And the business then of scrambling and mixing becomes extremely important to me. I tell you, if you see on the drawing some vestiges of existing street patterns, but then virtually throwing a kind of omelet on top of it and saying, instead of having these regularized systems, let things grow up and amongst. And I, I pursue that again in a actually earlier project in the last drawing uh, as a final stage in a series of stages where a li little piece of Berlin, it's in the western end of Berlin, metamorphose and start to scramble together. The red parts are the higher parts and the gray parts are the lower parts, but the whole of the thing, as time goes on, it, it merges. I was interested also, as were my students at the time, in the notion of the parasite, the parasitical element, clasping onto the pre-existent building and then beginning to deform it. And this was before really uh, students were doing a lot of things with computers. Later on in SIARC in Los Angeles, I watched some of my students actually deforming buildings. And in another project where we were taking the proposition, the doomsday proposition that London will eventually go gurgling under the waves, it will, it will be flooded. Um, I'm rather self-satisfiedly sitting 60 meters above sea level or maybe 100 meters above sea level, but a lot of London is not. And this was a doomsday scenario where we said, well, what will happen? The people will have to escape up rather not high tech structures. They will have to scramble, you know, the whole economy will have collapsed, the water will be coming up. They will scrabble together bits of old disused railway sleepers and God knows what, and climb up into these towers. It's just a very doomsday uh, notion. Now it should go. Ah. <laughs> Uh, and then I'm, I'm rushing across many different <clears throat> projects done at different times, which all revolve around certain themes. This was a, a piece of a plan of something called Veg Village, the notion that houses would largely consist of vegetation and that over time, these would, would kind of merge into each other. They would, they would grow and grow and overlap, but in fact, 
knitted into this are some pieces which are actually quite organized vegetation. They're not just sort of uh, letting it all happen, but they're actually organized vegetation which involve hydroponics and, you know, again, back to the, to, to the controlled vine in a way, but making it part of the way in which the city, uh, the village rather, in this case, develops. It also was looking at patterns of um, river isthmus conditions. And, or you simply escape. You just get the hell out. I mean, again, this is for the privileged few, I suppose, but it's somehow, sometimes the notion of the total escape object somewhere, this is somewhere up on a slight hill away from the sea. If you look at the drawing, you can see that's a hint that there might be others, but they are, they are little areas, they're little, little escape things. Also, I suppose I should don my hat to Bruno Tart in 1914 with the glass pavilion, if somebody hasn't noticed. Now, I live about one, one and a bit kilometers down the hill from a privileged village, which is called Hampstead. And it sits, and you can see the couple sitting on the big, park, very large park, which is called Hampstead Heath. It's almost really a natural, like a piece of natural countryside. They're looking down into the city of London, but they are happily up and away from it. And in, in, I've just been completing a book at the moment where I talk about being a young guy from the provinces coming up to London and hovering around Hampstead because it wasn't as terrifying as the city. It was an escape. It was a little town, claims to be a village, but effectively it's a little town that is separated and elitist, in fact, very expensive. Uh, I can only afford to live down the hill and near to it. But it raises the issue of escape <coughs> again. Can a city contain a, which it does, but not enough, pockets of escape related maybe to the hill, the river, the predominant uh, winds and so on. Or can you, this is another project done with my friend Gavin, where we looked at introducing market gardening right in to East London. And you see the, 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 the little patches of heavy vegetation. And, and again, again, that quote of the, of the vertical, the vertical uh, con construct with the vegetation going up it. Uh, this is a lovely, slide which a friend in Vancouver put on, on the internet, um, Trevor Body. It's a hotel in Vancouver. It's lovely, it's a wonderful picture, but it doesn't actually do anything because it's still a complete dense four square building. It just happens to have a nice dress on, but you can't help liking it. It, it doesn't solve anything. And I'm fascinated then by the book cover of the famous book, Colin, Colin Rowan, Fred Cota's Collage City. It, it depicts the ground plan of the city of Wiesbaden, which I happen to know. And if we look at, you can see in the, in the aerial view, it takes a corner of that diagram. There is the old compacted, uh, gr mostly gridded, compacted small German city. And then it, at a certain point it releases it onto a very gentle hill which has all the villas so it's at a and b city i, I think i've never I, I, i'm very brilliantly chosen diagram because it in extremist it takes this figure ground and it says there is the compact city or is this there's a scattered city and so i Go around, I'm, I'm a North European. I think you have to bear that in mind. I'm essentially a North European, and I tend to be fascinated by North European cities. This is Malmo, which I happen to know very well. It's a very windy city, and yet it has a series of very interestingly co coordinated series of squares, city squares of different sizes, and I'm fascinated when I've been to Malmo 
how these squares relate in a North European context. I think the square has a, is a very intriguing uh, form. And then I take another slightly smaller city, which I know again very, very well in the Eastern part of England called Norwich. And here there's a, what I love about Norwich, it's a, it has a fantastic theater of its parts. In this piece, there is on the hill behind, I don't know whether you, my head's in front of it, but there is, when I'm looking, I can see my head in front of it. There's a castle. And then you drop down from the castle through a narrow, narrow street. And then you go into an even narrower arcade, a glass arcade, which has uh, Arnival, Jugendstil detailing. And then you come out of that arcade and you burst upon the side of these colored uh, colored market stalls. It's, I think, the largest market in, in England, largest fixed market. And it goes slightly up a hill so that the, it's like a, a kind of laid out tapestry or, or, or quilt. And then behind it, you have the very large Neo-Scandinavian town hall. And things like that fascinate me, that they, whether by accident or partial accident or the rolling of history, the party, the, the castle, the mound, the narrow, the arcade, the bursting, the theater of, of cities is, is a, a tremendous fascination to me. And when I was a professor in Frankfurt, I was fascinated by the fact that Frankfurt and, and Offenbach sat next to each other, but refused to congeal. And I, being an outsider, perhaps, thought, why don't they congeal and have a proper city? Um, well, this delay is... Which I, and my city, I laid in a kind of avenue of villas, except the villas were not completed villas. They were large... Uh, Mega structures. If, again, behind my head is this picture of the of the concrete mega structure, waiting for different people to interpret each villa, each villa. And then, when I say villa, really there are small apartment blocks, and they would be integrated. Then, in 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 um, Taipei, in a competition, I was interested in the physiognomy of the city, moving from on the left hand side. We see very tight four square, but very brightly colored, colored. And as you go along the half kilometer, it metamorphoses from hard to less hard, to soft, to downright wobbly. And it metamorphoses from the brightly colored, slightly colored to, to monochromatic. So I'm interested in, in, in urban, urban design involving color and the physicality, the nature of the physicality. And I love collecting kiosks. Uh, I irritate my wife who's stopping, who's also an architect, but we, we stop all over the place when in the days when we're allowed to travel. And I'm always taking what appear to be trivia. I think that from these trivia, most uh, they're, they're from, from Los Angeles, I think Mexico City, Tel Aviv, Perth, Australia, uh, Copenhagen, and probably two from Berlin, I'm not sure. And, and um, they, you read them and you read the psychology of the place. And so in this project, I insert uh, such things into and under parts of the building. And Melbourne, which is one of my favorite cities, not only for architecture and conversation, but also for food, but I digress. Uh, it, is, it, it shows its, its idiosyncrasy by the fact there's a lady singing opera. There is a guy playing Beethoven on the electric piano. There are people buying cacti from a, a market store. It's a very sophisticated town. It, it reads its sophistication on its sleeve of the trivia. Uh, now, many people, even the most hard-nosed, the most irritatingly political, the most tiresomely pedantic all people and the nice people all want to go to an Italian hill, to a Tuscan hill town. That's where they, uh, they all want to be in Tuscany, in a hill town. So I, I sort of love and hate this, this notion. 
simultaneously. So I thought, okay, if you can't beat them, join them. And I look at the hill town. This is one earlier version of the hill town. And I go for, I actually invent in plan my own take on a hill town, except of course the irony is, the arrogance is that it's a sort of Peter Cook hill town. It has some things drawn from observation of, of you know, the sort of Camilla Sitter conversations and some which are deliberately flying in the face of them. And I say, what happens if you mix this all up together? What happens, what happens? And here we have the view from the top of the hill town uh, with some, as I say, Peter Cook buildings. The, the Campanile is actually a communications tower. It's not in any way defensive or, or religious. We're looking down over the Tuscan countryside and the farm on the cypress trees in the usual way. And we're looking down and into becoming more developed uh, and deliberately a key, the core building of it. Maybe it's a hotel, maybe it's a growth, maybe it has something more complex going on inside. And I deliberately fold and scramble, except that there is a very straightforward market hall on the bottom left, just to remind us that, you know, life goes on in the normal way. And another view down the street where actually I'm interested in this drawing, though maybe it doesn't come across. I'm interested in the combination of the living building and the workplace, that returning to, almost to a 19th century concept of the workshop house, or even taking on board uh, what I've noticed about the, the traditional Chinese shop house, shop house, where you can have an in, almost an industrial activity or commercial activity or family or the grandmother. There's no dividing line between the typology of living and working. And perhaps, you know, again, vis-a-vis -vis the pandemic, we're coming back to considering that more seriously. Here is the wall of the hill town, which is, of course, is the giveaway. It is inhabited. Uh, some projects done with Gavin uh, regarding vegetation in moving into the city. This is some preliminary work where we were involved in, in a new town that is being built, as I speak, in, in Western Australia. The notion of bringing the park right, as, the finger of the park, right into the centre, not just having the park somewhere in a convenient suburb. And an old drawing where, again, one is very interested in the weaving, of the weaving of the watercourse, the controlled vegetation, the less controlled vegetation, the loose structure, the tight structure, that they are all part of a collage. And I feel, and I felt then and I feel now, that our architectural disciplines are far too demarcated. We say, that's housing, that's workplace, that's a park, that's a garden, that's a flat. No, I think that, that we've got far too, uh, maybe it's the developers, maybe it was modernism, because if you look at it, in my early training as a modernist from largely European uh, modernist theory, uh, there was the workplace, the hospital, the school, the washroom, the house, the open space, it was, it continued the sort of demarcation, which in, in an ironic way, the developers play the same game, except they have different priorities. Now here, as a visitor to Rice University in Houston, I was, I invented my own piece of Houston. I looked at what Houston is. It is a, a city largely hidden under trees. And I took that, I made a kind of controlled vehicle proposal, which now is, is, is a commonplace idea. I had large controlled vehicle highways that would pass these banners. I'm again behind my, I don't know whether you can see it, but there should be a picture of, of, um, of West Hollywood, of, of, of uh, famous boulevard in West Hollywood, which has the posters. Uh, and I take the poster as a kind of 
proto building. And here it is, here's an aerial view of that same project with the, the, the posters as they were, as darts running across and many, 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 many dwellings sitting under the trees with the controlled access or the, the vehicle being controlled. I go into detail on that, but that's a summary. And, and so I continue to be fascinated by vegetation. Even in this rather more modest project, vegetation as an a priori of the, of the, the building. Water, on the other hand, is a wonderful, wonderful condition. If only we could all live by the water. This is Gothenburg where the, the canal system, which runs uh, a, a, a series of angles around the center is always marked by a turret. I was fascinated by this notion of the of the sort of near Jugendstil period where where you change direction in the city, but you mark the change of direction with a turret. Again, modernism didn't like that kind of thing, but I think it's fantastically clever. You can't get lost. You identify your building, you identify where you are, and you know that when you reach the next turret, you're going to change direction. Wonderful integration of, of, of organization and form and iconography, but it's a lecture in itself, I think. And so I, over the years, this is again earlier stuff where I take the notion of the, of the um, North European waterside city and take the canal into the arcade. The canal becomes an arcade. or here, which is a mixture of an earlier drawing and a quite recent project, uh, earlier drawing of, of, of a project I called Arcadia, where I take the, the, the water side, the marshland, and I make it again somewhere where you can grow hydroponically vegetables and, and so on. And then the towers come out of it. The towers on the right are actually a much more recent project for Shenzhen, which didn't win the competition where again, I'm sitting the towers in the water. But now in this case, and in this case, the vegetation starts to creep up the built structure. There's another view of it before the vegetation has started growing. And here again, another indulgence. This was just a drawing that sort of grew. I started in the middle, more or less a, a, a scribble. I started, I drew the islands, continued and it, it grew into it. I draw, use drawings like this as a kind of sketchbook, if you can call it such. Uh, throwing out a series of sometimes contradictory ideas. Uh, and then, uh, very important, that last slide, you can go, can we go back? No, 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 one back. I want to establish the notion of the flaneur. It's a wonderful, uh, yeah, the flanner. What a marvelous notion! And, and, and in a project I did for a place outside Madrid, uh, I wanted to re reintroduce the notion of the flanner as constituent psychological element of the city. It's very difficult in, in these moments to have a you know you're not encouraged to be out and about, but in in good times it's a very important thing. And so. You can see some preoccupations, the kiosk, the waterways, the flaneur. And then, you know, nearly almost at the end, there are nonetheless, even in this situation, one has, I have a great appetite for the absurdity of cities. My favorite shop in Tokyo, where you can buy anything from sort of dirty postcards to a draining board. I, I love it. The village vanguard. And then the delightful absurdity of the city. And finally, uh, two slides. One, it's a drawing I did of uh, our apartment, my wife sitting working in one part, me on the right hand side, if we can see it, we probably can't, sitting, working, looking out of this window here at people coming by and delivering parcels, which seems to be the main activity and then out into the garden. And last slide, 
during that time, thinking of what kind of typology might happen. Can we look at backyard industry? Can we make things and live and grow in a relatively compacted condition? It's sort of part cartoon, part project in a sense. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for your uh, presentation. Uh, it was very interesting, uh, uh, your idea of fascination about uh, losing things in the garden. Uh, and I think uh, uh, you make a kaleidoscope of ideas and, uh, and the cities. And um, the question um, could be, if you see this uh, reinventing of the city in the notion of, um, of the ambiguity of the play with the ambiguity of different identity or different textures between built and built, vegetation, artificial, and so on. Yes, I think you caught the general idea. I mean, I, it's, it's, it's difficult in half an hour to summarize all one because I've, I've been deliberately making a collage of probably, you know, 40 years of different things. but. It is interesting being asked to talk about the city to say, I do not believe that there is a single answer. And I think, uh, you know, it's great to have heroic projects of the past or even of the present that, that claim that there is a predominant answer. I think that we need in these or any circumstances to use our ingenuity. I don't, I think in architecture schools, which I know a lot about, uh, not enough people talk about common sense, not enough poor people talk about ingenuity. They might talk about mannerism, they might talk about style, they might very much talk about what they think you ought to be doing now. So somebody will say, you know, you must be able to uh, digitalize brilliantly and amazingly and manipulate any material or somebody else will say no you must take sociological aspects as a as a priority and somebody else say no 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 what is important is the threshold yeah. but um yeah. i think we need to use our total ingenuity if we if we were like the uh guy uh, you no, know robinson crusoe isolated on a desert island uh he wouldn't be too purist about it you'd, you'd use whatever came to hand and i think Intellectually, I, I, I like that. I think one, one should use whatever comes to hand in your brain, non-exclusively. Yeah. Uh, you know, I, I, uh, I, I would like to ask you something because you design very peculiar, uh, uh, very special buildings. Uh, we have lots of problem in Romania about heritage. About yeah, really uh, building like in the context and in the heritage and so on. How do you see this uh, uh, this uh, idea? Of oh, we have it. We have it just as much in in, in <laughs> London. I think. And I think everywhere you go, almost there's heritage. Uh, heritage, heritage. I mean, I think that we preserve a lot of crap. <laughs> <laughs> I think that we uh, in, in 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 London. I remember saying once that there were one or two friends of mine who'd done very interesting things, this going back a little while, but I remember quoting that uh, three friends of mine, Peter Wilson, Ron Heron, who's now sadly dead, and, and Ron Arad, they all did buildings in a similar bit of London, but you can't see them from the street. If you're allowed near, or if you're allowed into the courtyard or somehow around, oh my God, this is really interesting. But the city didn't want, there's three of the most brilliant designers I've known were not allowed to show what they were doing. They had to hide like somebody hiding a sort of dirty magazine or something. It's just really, and I think I'm, we did, I can give you a very specific example. In, in, in Graz, where we built the Kunsthaus, Colin and I, we, one of the things was that we had to preserve a piece of elevation very important. It was a hundred and something years old. It was the earliest cast iron south of the Alps or whatever the hell it was. And we had to, it cost 
millions of, of euros to prop it up. Great expense to prop this piece up and then we could build around it. We found it had been brought in from England. It was a prefabricated thing sold in Sheffield. The guys in Austria bought it. It came on the back of ponies or how the hell it got there. And it was now considered a piece of Austrian heritage. I laughed like a drain. I said, it's some shit faces in, 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 in Sheffield who were onto a good thing and sold the Austrians these bits of, of metal. Doesn't matter. It, as soon as it's there for 100 years, it becomes heritage. And I'm very cynical about this. I think yes and no. Uh, I wouldn't tear everything down, but and I live in a hundred-year-old district now where you're not allowed to even change the front window, you know, and you have to paint it in a certain way. Okay, it's very nice. It's a very nice bourgeois area with lots of trees, but I think you could introduce a few slightly naughty windows without the whole thing collapsing. It's 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 a tricky one, but my God, I don't think your Bucharest uh, edicts can be any stiffer than they are here. Everybody's paranoid about keeping stuff, of which I would say 40% is crap, but it's old. The other 60% is discussion. <laughs> Thank you very much, uh, Alex. Thank you very much for your um, very inspiring presentation. It was indeed a collage of... Uh, a lot of different and very, very uh, interesting projects, thoughts, and maybe even challenges, uh, especially when you addressed a little bit in the beginning and then um, right at the, uh, at the end of your presentation, the future of, uh, of living in a city, of urban living. Obviously, people are attracted to cities. We, we know that, and it's um, the... the Migration towards cities is, is ever uh, growing. Um, we're looking at maybe getting to 70% urban population within the next uh, few dozen years. In the context of the current pandemic, and maybe we should get prepared for similar uh, situations where we cannot cope with what nature uh, wants to throw back at us. Do you think that there is really um, a good potential for remixing the also separated programs of, of uh, functions of the city in, on the small scale in order to help people get away from the cars, get away from the um, enormous surfaces of land that they are using for not really uh, functions, but just mere um, commutation needs. Do you think this would be a solution to, to try to find um, a way to just, I don't know, walk or, or bicycle to, to work, uh, to the shop, to the market, and not uh, commute all the time? I, uh, I think we see it happening now. I mean, in, 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 in the, uh, the lockdown, um, I'm still, I have one building on the go in a provincial town in England, a university building, small one. And uh, I, being an old person, I'm 83, I don't want to risk going down to Bournemouth in a train or even in a car, or well, maybe in a car, but then you have to stay overnight. Anyway, uh, so a, a much younger person than me does it for me. And then he works at home I work at home, a third person involved also works at home, and we can occasionally, once every two weeks, he has to come round with a drawing that we can't transmit. This is very rare, and it's nice to see him we're all masked up and so on. Uh, we seem to be doing it. The building is moving more slowly than it would have done, but not 50%. It's moving maybe 30% more slowly, but it's happening. The steelwork does seem to arrive. The specialists do seem to come on a bicycle or however the hell they get there. And it raises the point why we don't really need an office, not at that this scale. I do lectures. I don't need to be in the school. You know, I'm doing 
wonderful series of lectures. I prepare them here. I would like to see the person sitting in the front row, you know, if they're picking their nose or grinning or something. It it helps me give the lecture, but I can't. I think that on the other hand, uh, vis-a-vis what was said a little bit earlier, I think the tendency towards more and more and more and more and people in the city, the pandemic may just have an effect of slightly leveling it off, which probably is no bad thing. I, the pandemic's disastrous among endangered species, but it may be useful that it's done that. The other thing is I, I certainly think that, uh, and I was saying so in my lecture, that the, type, the notion of typologies is only so good so far I know that in German schools of architecture in particular, every student, you know, has to know what the, 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 the uh, city house is, what the village house is, what the apartment is and so on. And, and many of them say, okay, now I know how to do buildings. And the notion of the guy who builds canoes on the ground floor and then somehow other gets into making, let's say, shower compartments, though he used to make canoes. And his sister on the top floor is working as a graphic designer, but also gets into making objects for children. And then, you know, somebody else moves in and says, since you're making shower compartments, I'm going to make taps but I'm only down the street, this kind of thing. Uh, it was perfectly acceptable in, in the 19th century, it's still perhaps acceptable in a few communities, but here, you know, I was watching your Shuko window advert that I had to sit through. We're using Shuko windows on the building that we're building. So, I, you know, I hear a lot about Shuko buildings every, every week, but, uh, and they come from Germany and that's very nice. And I, I have fantastic admiration for German windows. You know, if you want to stay comfy, have a German window. And I, it, of course it raises the issue, could Joe Smith down the street make a window anything like as good as Schuko can make it? You know, frankly, no. And so you would have, is there a trade-off? The better and better that Messrs. Schuko get at making their window Okay, maybe, they, and, and, and probably having to open a factory in, in Taiwan or, or in Vietnam or somewhere in order to make the window cheaper than the German workers. And still it having to make its way right down to Bournemouth so that we can put it in the wall. It's an interesting issue. It's, it's a, I mean, I, I'm no economist, but I am also a realist. Uh, I think we can only go so far with the villagization of the city. Those of us who are privileged enough to have trees outside our window and a garden to escape to and supermarkets who are willing to send a bloke down in a van if I suddenly want a bottle of white wine or a leg of lamb, it's wonderful, but it's, can it, to what extent can it be reproduced? I still think that we are, we haven't, you know, there's another issue about the house. In, in my training and in the books and, and, and government regulations that I've had to use in the past, it was presumed that the family, the father was shaving at a certain time. It gave you tables of when most people are shaving, when most people are watching television, how much space somebody needed in order to cook, how much space the kid who was doing their homework needed. And it, it was always running... 30 years behind what actually happens, you know? And I think now, you know, we also have the aspect of physicality and theatre. Uh, I'm sitting in front of you on this screen with a nice shirt on. I put the shirt on specially for you because it's like going doing a real lecture. I might be sitting in my underpants. Uh, there might be absolute shit all over the floor. You can only see the nice wall behind me which has, it used to be my son's bedroom. And we, he has a whole collection of soft toys that we've made into a kind of art piece. And it has some of my drawings on the wall. You don't know what else is in the room. And so do we now 
And it's say it's the equivalent of dressing up to go to a party. It's it's a it's it, and it's a very interesting one because it makes one think about the room very differently from how we thought about it half a year ago. The same with the street. I now have to enjoy my immediate area where I go for walking, which is bourgeois streets. We start looking at, my wife starts photographing plantations and we start looking at, at, at people's windows in a way that we never we used to just go past it and say, oh yeah, it's down the road. Now we're looking at it as if it was a whole city. We're looking at, at Lower Hampstead as if it was a complete metropolis, you know, and, and actually you don't, compl- uh, we would go mad if we didn't, but it's interesting, it makes you look at the positioning and scale of things. So therefore there's a corollary between that and this notion of activity. Uh, at this moment, I am working, but I don't have to go into an elaborate process between that and then sleeping. As soon as I switched your thing off, I can lie down here. I can get through a couple of glasses of wine. I can gossip with somebody on the phone, but I can't see them. In former times, I would have to fly to Bucharest, stay in the nice hotel, go sightseeing, meet a few new interesting people, uh, update my, my fascination with Bucharest, which is with those very weird spaces you have between streets, which I've never got my head around, very particular to Bucharest. I'd love to do that. No, I'm seeing a bearded man on the left, a guy in a gray suit on the right, and a guy with a mask and a white shirt behind you. It's pretty poor stuff. On the other hand, I can switch it off and I don't have to get on the airplane. I don't, you know, it's, we will have to design more things with different combinations. And as I come back to a central theme, we need to use ingenuity. It's forcing us to be ingenious. It's forcing us to be inventive, not just those people who say, I have the standard formula for doing a house, that will work, that will work, that will work. No, you've got to think again. And I, I like that challenge. Oh, um, a long one. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, we are very honored that you want to come uh, in Bucharest. And oh, we yeah, my wife had, used to have a relative in Bucharest. <laughs> they it's died. So we... <laughs> and we are very honored because uh, is here with us Sherbanti Ganash, um, who would like to ask you uh, one question. Please, Sherban. Well, thank you. I'm lucky. I'm lucky. I'm on the short list of people who have the chance to address your question, uh, Mr. Cook. So I was wondering what kind of question, if, if I have this chance, I would rather ask my students. Finally, I got this book, you certainly know, yeah. which I bought in London uh, 2008, the year it came out. Mm-hmm. And I would like to ask you about drawing, because you presented fascinating drawings. What do you think about the future of drawings? They will still stay the motive force of architecture. How do you see it now after 12 years? Yes, what you, I have to say, uh, a great pity you bought it. The first, there's now already some time ago, a second edition of the same book. Yeah. Where <laughs> I've added in about 30 pages discussing the implication of the, of the digital or the computer-based drawing. Uh, largely discussing it with certain good friends of mine who are really into that and and produce beautiful things. Uh, I think that, um, and I have this conversation very often with my wife, who's also an architect. In fact, she's out in the garden photographing me now as I speak. And uh, she always said she was not a good drawer. She was a model maker. And she worked all her projects out mostly in models and, and with difficulty learned to draw. We had in London a very particular uh, drawing syndrome, I would say the last uh, sort of, let's say 30 years ago. It was a mixture of, of pedantic drawing and, and a kind of romantic drawing. And 
everybody at the A and subsequently at the Bartlett, everybody draws pretty well. And sometimes when I visited other places to visit architecture schools, some places like Tel Aviv or somewhere where they drew with their foot. I mean, <laughs> the drawings were terrible. I found it very difficult to take the work seriously if it was badly drawn. Now that is an admission of a failure. That is an admission of narrowness of mind because it is possible to produce a good building with the minimum. I mean, I, I, I think uh, Schindler was only drew apparently on the wall, on the plaster work what he wanted to happen, yet he did fantastic building. It's an intriguing one because I think there's certain things that were, the great thing about drawing is that you can, you can predict the impossible. You can conject the impossible. You can mix a piece of pedantic neorealism with a piece of pure fantasy on the same drawing. You can say, this thing may be like that, but when I do the next drawing, it may be like that. And of course, the computer, I can't do it, but the computer can also do this. It can deal with time and flow. And I think predictive designing, uh, al designing alternatives, rolling alternatives over each other, collaging, then saying, OK, freeze. <laughs> God, that's what we're going to build tomorrow. Uh, is 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 a fascinating i do not see any dividing line between drawing and making as we speak and i'm not going to show it, it's not good enough i'm making a an aluminium structure in our garden i'm making a gazebo i'm still young enough to drill aluminium thousands of drill holes and screws and this thing, I did draw it. Yeah. My client is my wife, so she's demanding. But I did draw it. But there was a certain point at which I stopped drawing and may start making. And as the thing has to be adjusted structurally, I'm inventing on my feet. I sit on a seat looking at it and saying, it's doing something wrong there. Let's... And that to me is a drawing. It is a drawing. I'm approaching it in the same way that I would a drawing. It happens to be something I have to hold in my hand and drill and screw with screw, but it's a drawing. I, I don't see any dividing line. The other thing, just before I finish, is that I was a, when I first uh, started at architecture school uh, thousands of years ago, I, I, uh, I was not a good drawer. There were other people, even in the little school I was at, who were better drawers. They could draw dogs and trees and I was a very mm, tentative drawer but I was determined to draw I was determined to somehow find my way to do it so I'm still a systematic drawer I'm not a sort of oh there's, there's a dog there's a tree I have my sketchbooks are not good they are organizational while I was waiting watching the adverts I was scribbling something there, which you see is a very simple scribble. Uh, uh, it's an idea of something. And, and it, it, the, 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 the fountain pen is wonderful. It allows me to drift. In one lecture I do, I actually have filmed myself drawing with the fountain pen. And recently the Bartlett School has bought me a wonderful device here, just off screen, which will allow me to be drawing on the camera which will then go on the zoom and so you know i it's a way of thinking drawing is a way of thinking and experimenting and putting the unlike with the unlike whereas of course one of the conversations i have with with digitally based people is i say your damn digital thing is only doing what is correct there was a wonderful uh, piece of gossip that went around 15 years or more ago, uh, where in the, it was said that in the early days of the late Zaha Hadid's office, they were doing incorrect drawings because the Apple computer hadn't got as very sophisticated at that time. This is probably 20 years ago, whenever it was. 
I don't know whether it's true or it's a fiction, but it's a wonderful notion that as soon as the computer started to get more sophisticated, it stopped them doing naughty things with it. Uh, I can still remember extremely long time ago when one first started using a Xerox machine that you could do naughty things if you pulled the paper and distorted it. I'm all for things that aren't quite correct, you know? Uh, and I think that can apply outside drawing, but the drawing, you know, what it was is the struggle to become an adequate drawer forced me into certain tricks. I have certain tricks, there's certain things I can't do. Uh, and so I do the things I can do more and more. Uh, and, you know, uh, there's, there's a lot of conversation here, but it was what was interesting doing the book, particularly the second edition of the book, was actually talking to people who I admire and, and looking at their ways of drawing. Thank you so much. <laughs> I'm delighted. <laughs> Thank you very much, Sir Peter Cook. Uh, it was a great honor having you with us. And uh, I think my major takeaway from this session is that uh, we have an actual responsibility of having ingenuity put up in the first place and find the best solutions for the uh, challenges at hand whatever uh, the context, the particular context may be, and not fall back only on rules, regulations, and predetermined recipes for success, or may it be failure. So thank you very much for your, you got for the your message. drop you got of it. wisdom. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. It's, it's, it's a great confirmation. Yeah. And uh, we hope to rather sooner than after, welcome you physically in Bucharest and maybe have a look at the backside of the streets that you're so intrigued about. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much.